self-awareness. In this chapter, I talk about reaching high without delusion, the biggest decision I've ever made, and whether IQ or EQ is more important for success in business. This chapter means a lot to me because I think the topic of self-awareness doesn't get enough attention. And yet, if there's one thing that's helped me win over the course of my career, well, I've said that about hustle and gratitude and all kinds of other things in this book, haven't I? Whatever. This is another characteristic that has really worked for me. If I could sell a formula made up of gratitude, empathy, and self-awareness, it would be my trillion dollar coconut water idea. My self-awareness is one of the reasons why I can comfortably say outlandish things and make hyperbolic statements. And I know that the same things that draw people to me turn others off and keeps them away. I'm okay with that because I think I can help more people and get my point across better when I'm an unfiltered version of myself. Knowing how you come across to others can often give you an advantage as an entrepreneur. Take sales, for example. You can set the tone in a scenario, anticipate how people might react, and thus be prepared to address their concerns and questions even before they've been able to articulate them. It's really a valuable tool to have in your communication tool belt. And it's something I look for and admire in others. Self-awareness is underestimated now. But I know someday, when I'm in my 50s, 60s, or 70s, it will be the subject matter of the day. If there's a chapter in this book that you would read or listen to twice, I'd say it'd be this. Hi everyone, I'm Beth Comstock from GE. One of the things I work on is trying to get a company that's been around for 130 years to remember that it was once a startup and to try to be as fast and nimble as a startup. I'm also one of the many Gary V fans. Uh, he knows as much about entrepreneurship as anyone. So I'm really excited to read the next 10 questions in the Ask Gary V book. So thanks for having me. What are some easy ways to become more self-aware? I know that probably sounded funny in your speakers and that makes me laugh. Okay, this is a heck of a challenge. You know, if you asked me what's something I could spend time on that's not my business, I would go into two things. One, if unfortunately, I know I talk about some dark stuff here, but stick with me guys, this is how I keep so happy. If something bad happens in my life with a disease or something like that, I could see me becoming very, very, uh, you know, entrenched in the advocacy of like repealing it and fixing it and I could see that whole cliche thing playing out. The other one is if I really achieve my goals and become the Jets owner and all this other stuff and I've got some downtime in my 70s, 80s and 90s, I might explore self-awareness. Like can it be taught? I'm not sure. The answer to this question is very difficult. One, I think the only practical execution of becoming more self-aware that I've seen is creating a very safe zone for the 10 people that know you best. Let me explain. Put the 10 people that you know best into a room with you, one by one by the way, and tell them you're trying to understand yourself better and create a very safe zone. Tell them, mom, you're not gonna hurt my feelings. Sally, you're not gonna hurt my feelings. Tell them, look, I'm doing this. I know you're gonna say some things that I don't wanna hear. You gotta pound them. You gotta pound them to tell you the truth. But collect that feedback over the 10 closest people to you. Gather it, read it, and address it in a black and white way because the reason you're probably not as self-aware is your brain works in a black and white way, so you need the data. Otherwise, I really just don't have an answer. It's the most interesting thing for me because I am completely convinced it is the thing that brings people the most upside and happiness when they're at the height of their self-awareness. What's the most common mistake founders make when building a consumer-focused business? It's funny that we put this in the self-awareness chapter because that's exactly the vulnerability they misjudge the market. They, you know, Way too many people are not self-aware enough to know that the market is the game, not them. 
I never think that it's me. For all the stuff that you've heard so far that makes me think that I think I'm so special, I promise you, when it comes to this, when it comes to the market, the market trumps me every single time. I don't think I have this gift or the audacity to think I'm gonna make it great. What I do is I try and I try and I try and I get results and I adjust and I adjust and I listen and I adjust and I listen. Way too many people bet the farm on their intuition or what they think the world needs, or what they want the world to have. And so it's a lack of understanding of what consumers want, and it's such a big bet. The amount of consumer-based products that actually succeed, your app, your juice, your mixed nut company, your, your nail salon, these are all consumer things, right? You have customers, is <laughs> so low. It's so low. For every Instagram, there's a billion Insta shits, and so, You've really got to realize that uh, the lack of self-awareness really plays itself here because you need to have confidence. I want to get this very clear. That's why I'm sticking here. You need to believe in yourself, but never think you know better than everybody when you're thinking about a consumer product. Know that you need to put yourself in a position to play out your intuition, but then leave room operationally and financially to be able to adjust to what actually happened. It's good to understand our talents and weaknesses, but I fear we'll get trapped into a mindset of telling ourselves that there are things we can and can't do. Poet Robert Browning said, a man's reach should exceed his grasp. I want people to try lots and lots of things. I don't want people to tell our children what they are and aren't good at. How can you incorporate that idea into your discussion about self-awareness? I'm doing a lot of that and these ones hit me hard. This is a tricky one because you've heard from me, and this is where I start becoming a contradiction. And understand that I do think that my autobiography, my last book, or the, at least the big one, the one I've been holding back on, is gonna be called The Bridge. And the reason I'm gonna call it The Bridge is because I think I'm pulling equally hard on opposite sides on a lot of issues, including my ego and humility. Here, and you've heard from me, I talk about, in prior chapters, a lot about Blind self-esteem, honey over vinegar. You can do it, you can do it, we can do it. Yet, I'm visceral to a third place trophy, an eighth place trophy. So I'm very big on the beginning part of stuff. Don't hold anybody down in the beginning. But then when it plays out, it's actually very weird, it's similar to the question right before. Then when it plays out, you have to believe in the results and the meritocracy. Meaning, you should tell your kid, that they've got a real shot of winning because it pumps them up. But when they come in eighth place, you don't tell them they won. Do you understand? And that's the point right here. I remember Ted Rubin asking me this question, a great marketing guy and very active on Twitter. It's a very tricky line because I think we're living in a world now where parents have become so interesting to me to observe from afar because they want everything to be so good for their kids, they're not letting them accept failure. And failure's real. And so I think you should encourage everything up front, but then you should respect results and deal with the ramifications. Do you have any tips for presenting your consulting services to a potential client? PowerPoint? Video? (laughs) How am I supposed to know? Like, I don't know you. Like, are you good at making decks and that's how you communicate? Good. Do you have a great radio voice and you just want to play your voice talking about it? Great. Have you not noticed here that when I'm off the script, I'm free-flowing, but when I'm reading, I'm not as strong? Like, you have to know you. This is about reverse engineering you. As a matter of fact, I shifted the whole angle of this book. All these answers are, uh, you know what I'm looking forward to? All the people that are actually listening to this book while they're watching the book's answers in real form because you get to take both answers and put them against each other because what I'm doing in the audiobook is I'm putting myself in the best position to produce the best audiobook for you. Same thing with selling. I don't use PowerPoint. As a, you know, TV. Every time TV companies and TV stations and networks have asked me to read from a Chiron when I like co-host, I fail. But when I can just go ad lib, I'm a dominant player. So this question is very easy. Are you good at PowerPoint? Great. Are you good at making videos to tell your story? Great. Are you like me and you can walk in a room cold off of a one hour sleep and just go and win because you're good that way? Good, know you, self-awareness. Know your communication style. Put yourself in that best position. D-Rock knows he tells best stories when he's got a camera in front of him and he's recording that way. That's how he communicates better than the voice. That's how we all roll. Know you, know you. How does humor play a role in business, if at all? 
Look, humor is one of the pillars of society. Like, I think it's actually probably, I don't know this. Again, I think people cover these in other books. Humor might be one of the most interesting characteristics of a human being. I, I think it plays enormous. As a matter of fact, if you really look at like Super Bowl commercials, all those brands go towards humor. I feel like humor and high emo- like emotion, like tear jerkers are like the two, like I guess movies is a good way to look at it, right? Like there's not that many emotions you can play on and humor tends to work for almost everybody. So I think humor is quite important. I use humor. I use humor as an executive. I think when things are tight or uh, or scary, I use humor to uh, break up the tension. Uh, you know, look, but at the same token, back to self-awareness, I think there's nothing less exciting than when somebody's clearly not funny and they're forcing because they've romantically decided that they want to be funny. And so uh, that's probably why it's in the self-awareness category. Good job, Stephanie Land, uh, in categorizing these questions. Uh, so I-, I think it's very important, but I think it's only important if you got it. I think it becomes less important if you don't, because if you're trying to force it, it could become detrimental. What was the biggest decision in your life that made you successful today? Do I have a story for you? This one taught me a lot of lessons, actually. I haven't told this story that often either. Mr. Molnar, fourth grade science. Edison, New Jersey, Martin Luther King, grammar school. Uh, If you were there during that time, hit me up. I'd like to reconnect with some of my old MLK homies from Edison, New Jersey. I got my first F on a test. It was stunning, because in third grade I was a good student. I don't know what happened in fourth grade, if the entrepreneurial juices really kicked in, you know, I was still a little kid, but it was a switch like you would not believe. All A's and B's, I guess predicated on, it was basic enough for my brain to understand, and all of a sudden I'm getting F's on a test. Here's what I learned. One, I don't know why so quickly, and I don't think it's because I gave up, because I don't think anybody thinks I don't have tenacity. I realized, oh my God, I'm not a student. I'm not kidding, I was like, I'm a businessman. But two, I learned something else. I actually took that F paper. I was supposed to get it signed by my mom. This was the first time I really lied to my mom, right? Like I took the paper and I hid it in my desk. And I remember going to sleep that night and I couldn't sleep, my conscious. I figured out how to get rid of my conscious pretty quickly there for a while and then my dad brought it back and we got into that already. But I was scared crapless. I had to wake up in the middle of the night, tell my mom about it. And it was a whole to do. But it's probably the moment in my life where I decided I needed to own being a businessman. This is weird, guys. I mean, I don't know how many of you have fourth graders. I'm trying to think, Misha's what, six, first grade, seven, eight, nine. I was nine years old. I was nine years old, nine. And I really understood the impact of this F. Like, like I was some wisdom. I really think I'm an old soul. Like, I think I was had wisdom beyond my years. I really, 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 really was like, oh my God, I need to be this guy. I need to keep doing the lemonade stands and I need to sell my garbage pill kids. And I just, I'm that guy. And I really kind of punted school. I fully punted school two years later, but that was the seed, that F, that test, that science play, that hiding of it to know that I didn't want to be a bad guy either because my conscience got the best of me. That moment changed my life. What was the toughest thing you've ever had to do for your career? That was definitely when I kind of made the decision to leave day-to-day operations of Wine Library and do something with AJ. I always know I wanted to do something with AJ. As he got older, it became more obvious that he wasn't gonna work with my dad, so it wasn't gonna be the expansion of Wine Library. The liquor laws were, you know, back to the screw you Texas, were tough, like interstate shipping. It, the inter, my Twitter and Facebook and Tumblr investment, the timing just all worked out that it was obvious to me that it was time for me to do something else. But the thought of leaving Jeff DeRose, Brian De La Torre, Eric Kastner, Ian Doran, Brandon especially, my dad, Justin, my brother-in-law, Bobby, I'm giving shout outs right now because I want to. The thought of leaving them from a day-to-day standpoint, and most of all, and this is just the truth, leaving the baby that I built, like I was such a big part of the growth of Wine Library, that was quite difficult. Um, to start something new, to start something fresh, at the height of our strength. Um, you know, I feel like there was a part of me that realized I was at the top of my game at wine, and that became boring. The climb was maybe over. Um, that was really tough. It's kind of like the emotions are starting to flood back right now. It was a it was a very difficult time, and it, and it took, it, and anger came into play for a little bit. I was like, mad at everything around me, because I, I could just start feeling it, not unravel, because I've stayed close to it, but it, you know, luckily I haven't had a lot of tough things. That was a very big positive. Both businesses, I mean, I'm, they're both doing great and everything's great, but that was tough. That was very, very emotional. How do I keep low self-confidence from keeping me from succeeding? 
I often say that self-esteem is the ultimate drug in our society and really I wish that I could sell self-esteem because I know the Jets tomorrow. You know, you wanna be honest? I don't think you can. Uh, You know, I mean, if you have low self-confidence, the ability to be successful is not very high. You're just not gonna believe in yourself. You're not gonna take the risks. You're not gonna put in the work. You're not gonna make those jumps. It's why I believe so, and you know, it's why I believe so much in therapy and things of that nature. Anything that can help somebody unwind whatever made them insecure as a child, normally parents, sometimes environment, sometimes one bad kid in school, a disability, uh, something you were born with, anything they can do to unwind that is something that I believe in, you know? And I believe in communication more than drugs, right? I believe in, I think drugs are band-aids and I think communication is how you actually get it out of your system. So you don't overcome low self-confidence to become successful. What you do is you attack low self-confidence, fix that, and then open up your door to success. I do think there's something I've figured out. I think my positivity and confidence absolutely amplifies around the people around me. I have watched myself make people that were less confident more confident by downplaying their insecurities and uplifting their skills. And so the only other answer I have besides therapy or a group of people or whatever allows you to get that poison out of your body, the only way to really do it is surround yourself with people that are highly confident and are kind and want to deploy you know, that, that confidence on you. So I think the two answers are get it out or Find people that are so willing to lift you up that after a while, you just, you know, you know how they say you act like the five people you're closest to? You know, all of a sudden you just start changing. I mean, it's been fun for me to watch. It's probably the thing I get the most pleasure out of. It's probably why I do the Ask Gary V show. I am single-handedly, and I'm not, I'm willing to say this, lifting certain people with lack of self-esteem to a higher level of confidence through my sheer confidence and my sheer you know, pounding them with making them believe. A lot of small businesses fail because they refuse to accept when they're not good at something and insist instead on doing it themselves. How would you suggest telling someone they need to stop? Direct to their face. Mike Tyson punched the jaw, the truth, angry, aggressive, because if they're not, you know, Again, this is step two. I'm assuming you've done the honey. Hey, sweetie, you shouldn't do that. Hey, sweetie, you shouldn't do that. Listen, I think I'm secretly still a proponent for hitting kids. And that's gonna probably get a huge reaction on social, so I'm ready for it. I'm not saying beat the crap out of your kids, but I gotta be honest with you. You know, if the little guy doesn't understand 63 times of honey, maybe a little tush slap wouldn't be the worst thing that ever happened. It's not so crazy that it used to work that we are in such a politically correct world. Now, Lizzie's not gonna let me touch the kids. Deep down, I'm probably not willing to touch the kids, but it's kind of the energy that I'm trying to deploy in this statement. That's why I went aggressive with it, which is you've got to tell them, and more importantly, sometimes you have to do this, which is you've said your piece, you've tried to help them, and then you just let the market eat them up. That's what I love about business. The market, unlike your mother or your best friend or your business partner, they don't care. They do their thing and either you win or lose. And if uh, they suck at it, the market will prove it to them because they'll go out of business. Do you think it's necessary to have an outgoing personality to be a successful entrepreneur? Mark Zuckerberg, David Karp, Kevin Systrom, Ev Williams. These are the founders of Instagram, Tumblr, Facebook, and Twitter. Not all of them are huge, outlandish, Ask Gary V characters. This is silly. Bill Gates isn't the life of the party from what I hear. I mean, absolutely not. That's crazy. As a matter of fact, there's far, I actually believe there's far more entrepreneurs that aren't so Richard Branson uh, than there is. I mean, because that's why you know the few of them that are out there. There's not that many of them. As a matter of fact, I think I get disrespected for my chops because I'm a little bit of a character. So absolutely not. That's been proven. That's not even, that's not an opinion. Let's go document the 7,000 most successful businesses in the last 100 years. And I promise 5,000 are not outgoing and 2,000 are outgoing. There's clearly, that's, that's silly. Let's move. Hey guys, it's Alex again. How do I overcome my people pleasing nature? Why would you want to? This is super interesting to me. And society is very against people pleasers. 
it's viewed as a weakness. I would tell you that I am a stunning, aggressive, huge people pleaser. And it's the reason I don't fire as quickly as I should. So many of my small micro vulnerabilities, things that I critiqued already in this book, things that people can say about me behind my back, almost all of them are because I'm such a people pleaser. There's something more interesting. So much of my success, so much of what I've achieved, why I'm gonna win at the highest levels, bigger than all of you listening, is because I'm such a people pleaser. And that, my friends, is how I think about this. It makes me so mad that people have been taught that this is a negativity when I think it's a huge positive. So if you're lucky enough to have been born to people please, as long as you have your balance down, and I've talked about me being concerned long term that I left too much on the table, which is people pleasing, as long as you get enough for you, you know, I talk about 5149. So maybe I have a really good balance if I'm actually delivering on that 5149. Give 51 to the other person. That's people pleasing. You might be 80 20, and if, as long as that 20 is enough for you, you're good. But if 32 is what you needed, you need to move it up to that. So you need to decide what kind of people pleaser you are, and is that people pleasing coming so much at your expense that you're not willing to do it anymore? And let me explain expense it's not just money, it's happiness. I get much more happiness out of people thinking I've changed their life than by making an extra 100K or million or 10 million. People pleasing, my friends, is a gift. Nurture it. You get very personal when building your brand with the public. How personal is too personal? Where do you draw the line? Well, I mean, I draw the line in a lot of places, right? Like, it's really hard to find pictures of Lizzie, Misha, or Xander. So I keep my personal life very, very private. Um, meanwhile, there's vines of me sitting on the toilet. And, like, I'm willing to have any kind of lighting. And I'm right now, as I'm reading this book, DRock is periscoping this to people. I'm always on the record. I think this is a personal question for people at every level. I'm not going to judge you on what you share, what you don't share, is dressing sexy too much or not enough? Do you give away your best secrets or not? Everybody's got their own cadence. Everybody's got their own context. Everybody's got their own line in the sand. I don't think I should judge this, but what I think I can do right now to bring value to everybody's listening is nobody should judge this but you. The biggest reason people are being held back is they're worried about what everybody else thinks about what they're doing. Are you self-promoting too much? Are you showing a little too much skin? Are you giving away your best secrets? You should be monetizing that. Don't let anybody else judge your decision on this. The reason this works so well for me is I'm the judge and jury with Lizzie being the only other voice in the world that can be part of this equation because I'd like to gain my cute kids for some more likes too. But the fact of the matter is that's it. Don't worry about everybody else and this will work out for you every time. What do you think is more important in business, IQ or EQ? I think EQ. You know, I just, at the end of the day, I think IQ is becoming commoditized. I think as information is at your fingertip on a Google search away in one second on your iPhone, how can smarts be as valuable as it used to be? I do think it's commoditized. I do believe that fewer people are born with exceptional EQ, but Take this all with a grain of salt. It's because I'm such an EQ monster. My emotional intelligence is everything for me. And I'm sure some MIT person who's the greatest math skilled person of all time, Sally, let's call her Sally, who's made all her fortunes, all her happiness, all her travels, all her successes, met her husband, all the happiness came because she was book smart. She may say that. So what I do think is it's not a debate that information has been commoditized in an internet age. Right? I mean, there's no debating that. I can figure out things that I didn't have to memorize anymore. How tall is this mountain? Who's the president? Who's the CEO? How many ounces in there? It's all there now. And so I, I definitely think EQ will continue to gain momentum over the next 50 years as information continues to come to us faster, easier, cleaner, and thus becoming commoditized.